Hello there, this is Dr. Mintz. Uh, this is a talk about stroke imaging and some of the anatomy uh, that's necessary to understand stroke. Uh, this is showing a perfusion CT of a stroke patient. We'll go into a little bit more detail about how this is done, but basically we are able through computer analysis to uh, determine how much of an area of abnormality in the brain from a stroke, how much is permanently destroyed and so, how much is reversibly affected. So here is an example where this is called the umbra, the central part of the infarction. This is, this is the whole area that's ischemic. So the red area is what the computer has cal calculated based on perfusion imaging to be irreversibly uh, affected, stroked out um, tissue, and the green is potentially reperfusable and, perf and potentially salvageable. Stroke is the third leading cause of death in the United States. 143,000 people die each year from stroke. Every three to four minutes, someone dies of a stroke. The area we live in happens to be part of what they call the stroke belt, a high predilection for strokes compared with other areas of the country. And you can see it's not just population-based because New York and Massachusetts and populous states like that don't have the incidence that we have here in the South. Stroke is a lay term used by laymen and not, nece not necessarily a medical term, but it, it affects, it, it's a clinical finding. So a stroke is somebody who comes in with a sudden onset of a deficit, a neurologic deficit. The big question to be asked is, is it ischemic? Is it just due to a, lot, a lack of blood supply to an area of the brain, or is it hemorrhagic? So that is the first and foremost question when there's a possible stroke or when there's a clinical sign of a stroke, is to find out whether it's, it's just ischemic or if it's hemorrhagic. And that's what imaging can allow us to do. Now I'm going to drill holes, drim, drill home some of the anatomy that is critical. And one of the key areas to be aware of is here. This is the central sulcus. Everything in front of it is frontal lobe. What's behind it is parietal lobe. This is temporal lobe and this is occipital lobe. So the distinction between frontal lobe, which is all of this area here, and the parietal lobe, which is all the way area here, is the central sulcus, which, does, which divides and separates the frontal lobe from the parietal lobe. Equally important is the fact that there is a gyrus immediately in front of the central sulcus. Remember, this is a central sulcus, this fold, this invagination here. So this is the pre-central gyrus, which is motor cortex, and this is the post-central gyrus, which is sensory cortex. So pre-central gyrus is part of the frontal lobe and its motor cortex. Post-central gyrus is part of the parietal lobe, and it is sensory cortex. So if we can identify this central sulcus on a brain CT or MRI, then we can pretty much find out where an abnormality is in relation to the sensor, the motor cortex, the precentral gyrus, and the sensory cortex, postcentral gyrus. So in other words, is it affecting the frontal lobe or parietal lobe? And, and those are very important questions to ask in the case of a sudden onset of neurologic deficit. Okay, here again we have a different type of diagram, but still illustrating that there is a central sulcus that divides frontal lobe from parietal lobe, and pre-central gyrus is motor cortex, post-central gyrus is sensory cortex. Here is the actual item, the human brain.
Here you can see parietal lobe labeled. Here you see frontal lobe labeled. Here's the sylvian fissure. They're calling it lateral fissure. It's a sylvian fissure. And this is the central sulcus. They're calling it central fissure. It doesn't matter. Central sulcus. So this little thing right here, that crevice separates motor cortex, which is part of the frontal lobe, from sensory cortex, which is part of the parietal lobe. This shows the distribution of the major cerebral arteries. You have an anterior cerebral artery, a middle cerebral artery, and a posterior cerebral artery. The middle cerebral artery has the largest amount of involvement of eloquent cortex, in, in other words, cortex where if there's a stroke, it will show up somehow clinically. So here you have the central sulcus. This is central sulcus here. That makes this precentral gyrus or motor cortex here. This is postcentral gyrus, which is sensory cortex. Motor cortex is in frontal lobe. Sensory cortex is in parietal lobe. And a lot of this is controlled by the middle cerebral artery. This probably uh, overestimates the amount of anterior cerebral artery that we see on the convexity, the outer curvature of the brain. But anyway, it gives you some idea that there is some involvement of portions of motor cortex and sensory cortex from anterior cerebral artery, but far and away the most important and most common source of infarcts that we think about treating are those that are in the middle cerebral artery territory, and they are the most common clinical, clinically relevant strokes that we encounter, those that involve the middle cerebral artery. Posterior cerebral artery affects the visual cortex, and uh, we don't usually um, intervene if that's the only area that has been affected, or at least I have not seen that. Generally, what we're trying to preserve is motor control and, to a lesser extent, sensory awareness of various parts of the body. Okay, so how do we tell where the central sulcus is? The all-important central sulcus, which separates the frontal lobe from the parietal lobe, and therefore allows us to determine where the motor cortex and sensory cortex are. Well, this little mustache-looking thing here, you see this little thing right here? You see some other little things like that, but in terms of having something that is fairly symmetric, and has a little bit of a curvature to it, that's the cingulate sulcus. And if you can identify that, you go forward and to the side, and that is the central sulcus. On this side, you go forward and to the side, this is the central sulcus. That would tell us that this is precentral gyrus or motor cortex, and this would be postcentral gyrus or sensory cortex. So once again, you have the cingulate sulcus, which looks like this, and I'll hammer that point home. You go forward and to the side, and this is central sulcus. That makes the cortex in front of that pre-central gyrus of the frontal lobe, which is motor cortex, and posterior to that is post-central gyrus of the parietal lobe, which is sensory cortex. Okay, here's a little bit better of a close-up on another level. You're seeing this cingulate sulcus, kind of looks like a mustache, turned up on each side. You go forward and to the side, there's the central sulcus. From here, forward and to the side, you see this is, this is right at the same level, so this is not it where we're going. We have to go forward and to the side. This is the central sulcus on the right. So that makes this motor cortex, this sensory cortex. 
This is motor cortex. This is sensory cortex. Very important. And a lot of people, including a lot of radiologists, quite honestly, don't know this trick. And it can be very confusing and difficult without this to identify the the, uh, sensor, the central sulcus and to distinguish parietal and frontal lobes and motor cortex from sensory cortex. But this is all that it takes. So here we have some, this is a, showing a little bit more clearly that there's a subdural hematoma layering adjacent to some part of the brain. And now the question is, is it parietal lobe, frontal lobe, or both? Here's the cingulate sulcus. You go forward and to the side. That makes this the central sulcus, and this indicates that this is layering against just the parietal lobe, and we don't see any definite frontal lobe involvement. And then at another level, same thing, cingulate sulcus, forward and to the side is a central sulcus, forward to the side, central sulcus. Once you see the central sulcus, you know that in front of that is the motor cortex of the frontal lobe, and behind it is the sensory cortex of the parietal lobe. Okay, here we are up a little bit higher. You go forward and to the side. This is, remember, see, there's really nothing else that's quite like this, this little mustache thing. So you go forward and to the side, and that's the scent, that's the, uh, Central sulcus on the right. This is the central sulcus on the left. That makes this precentral gyrus or motor cortex. That makes this postcentral gyrus or sensory cortex. Here we are up a little bit higher. Here you can see very nicely the central sulcus on each side. How do I know? because you have this little mustache here. You go forward and to the side, central sulcus, forward and to the side, central sulcus. That makes this motor cortex, sensory cortex. Motor cortex, sensory cortex. Would I expect to have motor problems from this subdural compressing the brain under it? No, because it's not compressing the motor cortex. It's compressing a portion of the sensory cortex, though. And then it gets tougher as we get up high. In this case, you can still identify the, the uh, cingulate sulcus, the mustache, which is the cingulate sulcus. You go forward and to the side. Then you have the central sulcus on each side. And you can still do it up higher and at higher levels than that. So this little mustache sign is very helpful. And I equate it to this mustached singer, cingulate mustache. So think of the cingulate mustache as being that little mustache-like thing that if you go forward and to the side, you're in the central sulcus. So this is the cingulate sulcus. And we can tell that because there's a mustached, mustache sign or mustached singer, singer, singulate. I don't know. It's kind of confusing. But the word is mnemonic, not mnemonic. So mnemonic is a way to help you remember things. And I hope this helps you to remember it. But personally, I think repetition is the best way to do that. Where is this? This looks like the closest thing to a mustache sign we have right here. So if we go forward and to the side, this would be central sulcus on the left. Forward and to the side, somewhere in here, would be the central sulcus. So it looks like it's more sensory cortex, but there is some motor cortex involvement. This is motor cortex on the left, so there's some motor cortex involvement on the right. But it uh, uh, looks like this larger area of infarction is probably going to be more involving the parietal lobe sensory cortex. And some more images of basically the same case helping us determine whether, whether we're looking at the 
area of sensory cortex that's being infarcted, the motor cortex, or in this case, it's really both. Here we go. We can't really see too well on this level, but we can see, okay, it looks like there's a, there was a mustache sign here. This one's been kind of obliterated. You can see at the level above it, you have two. You have the cingulate sulcus. So you go forward and to the side. That's the central sulcus. That makes this pre-central gyrus motor cortex, post-central gyrus sensory cortex. Let's do it here. We go forward and to the side. This is central sulcus. So that makes this motor cortex, which means this is motor cortex affected here. This is sensory cortex, which means there's some sensory cortex involvement here. So it's showing us that we have both motor and sensory cortex affected by this fairly large stroke. This is in the middle cerebral artery territory, classic middle cerebral artery territory infarction. The key to identifying the central sulcus on head CT is which of the following? Cingulate sulcus. If you haven't seen it, the radiology assistant, which is not at all associated with radiologist assistants, but it should be, the radiology assistant website is an excellent resource, very well put together uh, information about a number of things and I encourage you to look it over so you know uh, what kind of resource it could be for your studying and for your future practice too. Okay, let's hammer home the vascular territories. You have middle cerebral artery territory which is the biggest swath that includes motor cortex, sensory cortex, hearing, and on the left side, in most patients at least, can, can affect speech, which is in the temporal lobe. So three vascular territories, anterior cerebral artery, middle cerebral artery, posterior cerebral artery. Nearly all or all of the strokes that I have seen that have been intervened, that have been intervened upon have been middle cerebral artery strokes because those are the ones that come in with a significant loss, such as loss of movement, loss of sensation, or both, can't stand up, can't talk, doesn't understand things because the speech center could be affected, and that's, uh, in most right-handed people, it's in the left cerebral hemisphere, the speech center. The speech production is in the pre-central gyrus inferiorly close to where the mouth is represented and uh, when that's affected uh, it's obviously a devastating uh, effect for the patient and then there's Wernicke's area which is an auditory speech center in the temporal lobe which can cause inability to understand language so middle cerebral artery is very hot territory for having very clinically relevant findings and, and um, warranting an intervention. So middle cerebral artery, got to hammer this home. I want you to have this picture in your mind. Middle cerebral artery is right here. Middle cerebral artery has anterior cerebral artery, posterior cerebral artery. This is occipital lobe where visual cortex is. This is going to be central sulcus cutting through the middle cerebral artery territory with motor cortex, sensory cortex, speech production, speech re reception on the dominant side and most patients left side. This is showing an MR that is revealing an infarct in three different patients. This patient has an infarct in the posterior cerebral artery territory and you can see that these are axial cuts, so we're looking way back in the occipital lobe. This is the anterior cerebral artery distribution, which is that ribbon that courses along the upper margin of the hemispheres. So this is the an anterior cerebral artery, and this is the central portion of the middle cerebral artery territory, which is right here, blue, middle cerebral artery territory, big, important territory. 
Here's a coronal cut showing you that the anterior cerebral artery involves the medial aspect of the hemisphere. Middle cerebral artery involves all of this, and posterior cerebral artery involves some of the temporal lobe. Just another colorful picture showing you border, border zones between the various distributions. So this is the border zone, this gray area between anterior cerebral and middle cerebral artery. Uh, here's a, the zone between middle cerebral artery and posterior cerebral artery. And that's where you can get what they call watershed infarcts. If there's just a low blood pressure, the areas between the distributions can become ischemic. Middle cerebral artery, anterior cerebral artery distribution, posterior cerebral artery distribution. Now this is the representation of the body in motor and sensory cortex, and they're very similar layouts and it just shows the disproportionate amount of representation which is given both for motor and sensory in the realm of the face especially the mouth and tongue and the hand especially the fingers so the whole trunk gets about as much representation as one finger does just as an example of how disproportionately represented parts of the human body are represented in these areas of the brain. And what do we have here? This is anterior cerebral artery. This is posterior cerebral artery. And the white is all middle cerebral artery. So that's going to affect the patient's hand, face, ability to smile, ability to speak, critical structures, uh, the tongue, speech production. So middle cerebral artery uh, has the most immediate devastating clinical effects of any of the three cerebral artery, ar cerebral artery uh, regions. This is just the medial aspect, just so you've seen that, showing that the anterior cerebral artery covers a lot of the medial in the midline portion of the hemisphere. This is the circle of Willis. This is a very good representation and we'll review this briefly. So here you have the vertebral arteries coming from the spine on both sides, entering the skull vault, ventral to the brain stem, and fusing to form the basilar artery. So we have vertebral artery here, vertebral artery here, basilar artery. The basilar artery, you remember, is ventral to the pons. This is the posterior cerebral artery. This is the middle cerebral artery. And these are the two anterior cerebral arteries right here. Okay, so this is the this, this structure right here is the anterior communicating artery, and it allows the two anterior cerebral arteries to communicate. The carotid vessels come up, the internal carotids come up, and that's what we're seeing here. We're seeing like the very distal one centimeter or so of the internal carotid arteries, and they give rise to the middle cerebral artery and then the anterior cerebral artery. And this part of the anterior cerebral artery is called the A1 segment of the anterior cerebral artery. A1 segment, and then this is the A2 segment. Not important you know that, but I want you to know that this is anterior cerebral artery, and knowing that's the A1 segment does help us understand that we are dealing with this circle of Willis. And this is a circle that assures perfusion of the brain if any one structure gets occluded. Let's say you block the internal carotid artery here. You still have flow coming in from this internal carotid artery and it can reroute some of the water, I mean some of the blood automatically to 
the uh, posterior cerebral artery, or the posterior communicating artery here, and allow blood to go from the perfusing patent internal carotid artery. It can go through the A1 segment, then across here, and then to the A1 segment here, and to this middle cerebral artery here, or can go this way. But the whole idea and the important point is that this is a circle of Willis, and it allows collateral supply so that if you have a big clot right here, blood can get to everywhere, theoretically, if a circle of Willis is, uh, is like this. But this is an idealized circle of Willis. They all vary a little bit in how big and how dominant things are, and some of them even have gaps that mean that they're actually incomplete. This illustrates how the M1 segment, okay, so remember, this, this looks, like it looks like it's curling up, but it's actually the internal carotid artery coming in from below and continuing as the middle cerebral artery here and giving off a branch, the A1 segment of the anterior cerebral artery. And then you have this posterior communicating artery. Okay, so this is the circle of Willis and it's a vital structure to understand. The principle especially is important to understand. But looking here at this coronal, you see that there are little branches coming off the M1 segment. That's here then. So we're looking at the M1 segment and it gives off branches this is in an axial plane, so this is a coronal projection. So it's showing that there are small branches that come off the M1 segment of the middle cerebral artery that uh, perfuse these areas of the basal ganglia. Here we have a CT showing, these are the same CT, showing that you have a little lentiform structure right here, a lens-shaped thing, and there's a little defect in it over here. You can see it more clearly here with this nice arrow is pointing to it. And that's an infarct of one of these small branches coming off the M1 segment of the middle cerebral artery. This is another diagram showing the disproportionate allocation of cortex for different portions of the body and the face and the hands are very highly disproportionately represented. The mouth and tongue particularly are, and in the hand, it's particularly the fingers, especially the thumb and index finger. Okay, and the proportionality of representation is pretty comparable for both the um, motor and sensory areas. So the sensory cortex, which is post-central gyrus in the parietal lobe, has a similar representation as that of the motor cortex, which is the pre-central gyrus of the frontal lobe. Here you can see our little friend, the cingulate sulcus, forward and to the side, central sulcus motor cortex, sensory cortex. Say hello to my little friend. Here is the homunculus. Funny looking guy. Here's the circle of Willis again with a diagram over here showing you that if you take this circle of Willis, you've got to imagine, move it over it's here. So here's the circle of Willis in this diagram. You can see how different it looks than this, but this is a very idealized, this is more like what you would see anatomically, but this helps you envision in your mind more clearly the structures that you're looking at. Middle cerebral artery, basilar artery, vertebral artery. Ten would be the a1 segment of the anterior cerebral artery, and this 
This is the po this is the anterior communicating artery, ACOM. Don't worry about it, unless you want to. Here's another diagram, just showing how these are the clipped off. This is where they've clipped off the internal carotid arteries that were underneath the brain, so that you can see that this is the very tippy tip of the internal carotid arteries. That is not an anatomic term, by the way. So these are the very tip of the internal carotid arteries, and it's showing that they continue out laterally as the middle cerebral artery. They send off a branch anteriorly, which is the anterior cerebral artery, including the A1 segment. It's called A1 segment until it gets to this point where there's a joining of the two, and then it becomes the A2 segment, but don't worry about that. And here you see the basilar artery. Here you have the two vertebral arteries coming up from the neck. They merge to form the basilar artery, which is right in front of the pons. And the circle of Willis surrounds the area of the optic chiasm and the pituitary, very central structures. This is showing the middle cerebral artery and how it branches over the convexity, the outer side of the hemisphere, and gives blood supply to motor cortex, which is green here, primary sensory cortex, which is orange here, Broca's area, which is the speech area here, auditory cortex, which is right here, that is where we hear. So Circle of Willis is in the base of the brain, location of most aneurysms because there are all of these little, little branch points and the branch points are where we tend to get aneurysms if we're going to get an aneurysm. And here of course is Professor Willis after whom this is named. Internal carotid artery comes up, gives rise to the middle cerebral artery, sends off an A1 segment of the anterior cerebral artery, and then there's a posterior communicating artery that connects the this portion of the internal carotid artery where the middle cerebral artery is coming off with the posterior cerebral artery. This is the basilar artery. Here is an in situ kind of appearance to take this diagram and superimpose it here. And here you can really see what's going on. The circle of Willis is in here. And the M1 segment of the middle cerebral artery is here. And then it branches out over the convexity of the hemispheres on both sides. Here you can see the positioning of the vertebral arteries, ventral to the medulla, and then the basilar artery, ventral to the pons. So when you have a stroke, there's usually a part of the stroked out portion of the brain where there's complete cell death, and there's also an area surrounding that which has compromised flow, but the neurons may still be alive. So we call the irreversibly necrotic or infarcted tissue to be the core of the infarct. That's irreversibly destroyed. And the penumbra, the surrounding area, is ischemic, but potentially salvageable if an intervention is done. And what stroke imaging has allowed us to do, particularly CT perfusion imaging, a real breakthrough, was we, were, we are now able to do a contrast-enhanced CT and identify not only where the stroke is and how big it is, but how much of that stroke is irreversibly uh, infarcted tissue and how much it, it how much of it is compromised but potentially salvageable so you can imagine if you have a very small core a very small irreversible area of, of infarct and a large area that is reversibly ischemic 
there's a lot of good that can be done by treating them because they can regain the loss of the the loss of uh, function that's attributable to the reversibly ischemic tissue. Okay, whereas the, in the re reverse case, if we have a very large core infarct, in other words, a very large irreversibly infarcted area of tissue with only a small amount that's ischemic, reversibly ischemic, then to intervene and to give thrombolysis, you're, you're, you're taking a significant risk with very little potential gain. So early signs of stroke include a dense middle cerebral artery, and that's because blood clots are more dense than flowing blood. And so a dense MCA sign uh, is very typical of a, of a stroke. So once in a while, we, we will see a dense MCA sign on an unenhanced CT of the brain. Signs of stroke include that dense MCA sign, which you see sometimes. On CT, you can see low attenuation in the area that's been infarcted. You also see a loss of gray-white matter differentiation and cortex, insular river, and, and lentiform nucleus uh, all can be involved. But the important thing I want you to know is that there's such a thing as a dense MCA sign, and that's actual clot in the MCA, and we often see it right in the M1 segment of the middle cerebral artery, low attenuation in the infarcted area. And remember, that low attenuation could be totally irreversibly infarcted tissue, and it could also be uh, reversibly infarcted. And that's where the, the CT perfusion image comes in and allows us to make that differentiation. Here's an example of a dense MCA sign. It's that clear. Here's an unenhanced CT. It almost looks like this is enhancing. That's a dense MCA sign. Here's a different patient with a little a short segment, but it, right at the bifurcation point of the middle cerebral artery, and that's dense MCA. Here's another dense MCA sign. Dense MCA, you correlate a dense MCA sign what does the arteriogram, the, the CT angiogram, look like? It looks like this. You have internal carotid artery coming up on both sides. It gives a middle cerebral artery off over here. But on this side, you don't see anything. Maybe a little tiny faint enhancement there. This is the axial plane. This is the coronal plane. This is the CT angiogram correlate of a dense MCA. So if you see a dense MCA on an unenhanced CT, this is showing you what's really happening there. On a CT angiogram, it's demonstrating that there's a big segment of middle cerebral artery which is occluded. Also, these lentiform nuclei uh, in the central portion of the brain, you have caudate nuclei, which are here and here. Those are part of the basal ganglia. And you have the lentiform nucleus, which is this right here. And that includes putamen and globus pallidus are the names of the structures there, but it's caudate, putamen, globus pallidus, but we just often call this the lentiform nucleus because it has kind of a lens shape, even though you don't see it particularly well here. But this is caudate nucleus, part of the basal ganglia. This is the lentiform nucleus, also part of the basal ganglia. Here you have a calcification in the uh, pineal gland. Here's the third ventricle. Here are the lateral ventricles. This line right here separates the cerebral hemispheres from the cerebellum. The cerebellum, at this level, we're, we're cutting through what they call the tentorium. The tentorium separates the cerebellum 
from the cerebral hemispheres. So here you are in the cerebral hemisphere, then you go through this tentorium, and you're now here under the tentorium in the cerebellum. This again showing that lentiform nucleus is partially indistinct, indicating an area of infarction. Here you see what they call an insular ribbon sign. If you look over here, you find that on a CT, the cortex is denser, meaning lighter in color, whiter than, than the white matter. So your cortex tends to be dense or whiter. And if you lose that, you see how here it all looks kind of gray, whereas here you have white and then gray. Here you've lost that insular ribbon sign, and that's an indication of infarction. You lose that gray-white matter differentiation. That's a key phrase, gray-white matter, meaning gray slash white matter de definition. Gray matter, white matter definition is lost. Here you can see very clearly the distinction between the gray matter, which is hugging these folds, and the deeper white matter, which has a darker coloration here. You see that nicely here, you lose it. So it's uh, a good sign for identifying a stroke. So you know now the core is the irreversibly infarcted tissue. The penumbra is the reversibly ischemic tissue. And if we have a huge core and tiny penumbra, that means there's very little that we can do to benefit, so it's too much risk for very little benefit. But on the contrary, if you have a small core, if this core is real tiny and the penumbra is really big, you have potentially a great deal of benefit that you can do with intervention. Here is an angiogram showing the circle of Willis vessels. Here is the idealized schematic of that. And this patient has, looks like an abnormality of the basilar artery. So here you have a vertebral artery. I don't see the vertebral artery on the other side. And this basilar artery is very narrowed. So I would say that that is uh, a a thrombus in the basilar artery, and there's, there's occlusion of the left vertebral artery, which is right here. So here's the right vertebral artery, which is this, basilar artery, which is this, and then what's confusing here is that we've cut off the internal carotid arteries on this schematic, just gotten them out of the way, but here this is all internal carotid artery here. See that? This is all internal carotid artery here in the head before it gets up to the region of the cella tersica where it branches off and gives the A1 segment and the M1 segment. A1 segment of the anterior cerebral artery, M1 segment of the middle cerebral artery. So this is the two of them superimposed. Okay, aphasia, what vessel is affected? Here you have the vertebral arteries, the basilar artery. You have the internal carotid arteries on both sides, internal carotid arteries. You know that the circle of Willis is here. This is the anterior cerebral artery on both sides. Here's the middle cerebral artery on the right. You can see that the very proximal par part of the middle cerebral artery on the left is occluded. We have no flow or very restricted flow in this short segment. So this would be part of the M1 segment, the first segment of the middle cerebral arteries. So the first segment of the middle cerebral artery is the M1 segment. The first segment of the anterior cerebral artery is the A1 segment. So we have an M1 segment stenosis or occlusion. So we are having a, an occlusion
right here. That's the correlation. So most of the ischemic strokes that we see have a central area which is more severely affected, and that's the core of the infarct or the umbra, and the core is surrounded by tissue which is ischemic but salvageable, which is the penumbra. So the core is irreversible umbra. The core is irreversibly ischemic, and that's also called the umbra. But the surrounding area, the penumbra, is salvageable to, theoretically or potentially. And this, all, this terminology all comes from eclipses and the shadow that's cast by various types of eclipses where the umbra is where light is completely blocked out from the sun and the penumbra is it's only partially blocked out. Same point, very important. Okay, here's an anterior cerebral artery stroke. Not quite as nice as those little diagrams, but it does show you that it's medial and it courses up superiorly and kind of on the left and right, paralleling the midline. Here's a posterior cerebral artery infarct, PCA infarct. This would be involving a part of the occipital lobe where visual cortex is located. Visual cortex is really in the medial aspect of the occipital lobe, right around here. So this patient would have probably a, a field cut. So if it's in the right side of the brain in the occipital lobe, it would affect the left visual field. Here's an MCA infarct that has evolved and has already a, quite a bit of mass effect. We wouldn't be imaging a patient for perfusion CT imaging to consider intervention on someone who's had a stroke that's, that's this old. This is probably a day or two old because it's gotten so much edema from the cell death that has taken place in that MCA distribution. You can still see it's an MCA distribution, but that has uh, given quite a bit of mass effect so that we have midline shift, so too late in this case to intervene. MCA stroke, that's, that's what we're seeing here. And also MCA, very clear delineation here of the middle cerebral artery territory, and again, having considerable mass effect. Why MCA? This is the village people. Maybe you remember that song. 